Hi, it's Katrina. There is a shocking story going around that there once was a very real princess frozen in time. Problem is that she may have died 800 million years ago. If you want to hear more, keep watching, because here are some crazy discoveries that could change history. The Princess In 1969, there was a rumor that something was discovered in a small Russian village with the potential to change everything. A woman, not just any woman, a princess was discovered in a marble casket that could disprove the theory of evolution, or at least prove that fairy tales are real. The summer of 1969 is more than just a Brian Adams song. That summer, coal miners in a small village in Tesulskago were hard at work. Almost 300 feet beneath the surface of the earth, the miners found a mysterious marble coffin. It was brought to the surface where the workers in filthy clothes and with coal dust on their faces gathered round. It was tense as the miners tried to open the mysterious casket. They couldn't get it open, and soon it started to melt. Like an ice cube in the sun, the coffin was slowly melting into a putty-like substance. When it was all melted into yucky pink and blue liquid, what remained was a beautiful woman who looked to be about 30 years old. She had huge blue eyes, open and unblinking. She was dressed in a pale white dress that seemed to indicate she came from the Middle Ages. This was a real-life sleeping beauty. The woman didn't look like she was dead, just asleep but with her eyes open. The more you learn about the story, the more it seems like this woman was a vampire. Except for this next part. Inside the melted coffin, miners discovered a rectangular metal box. The box was weirdly futuristic, and they couldn't open it. It sounds like fantasy, and perhaps it is. There are no official records, only rumors and whispers that have been circulating for almost 60 years. According to the reports, officials with the Russian government arrived in a helicopter and declared the mine a quarantine site. They couldn't get what remained of the partially melted coffin onto the helicopter, so they started draining the liquid. But when they drained the liquid, the corpse of the mysterious princess blackened. It happened instantaneously. As soon as the liquid was gone, the princess decayed in the blink of an eye. It was clearly the strange substance which preserved the woman like Sleeping Beauty. It's unclear how old the coal was in which the woman was found, but professors claim she was at least 800 million years old. The coal had formed around her coffin, meaning she had already been in the ground for a very long time. When scientists tried to analyze the strange liquid that had preserved her, they couldn't. The substance was unknown to science, with no way to determine its composition. This is a very strange strange story, and 800 million years is an incredibly long time. Perhaps it is proof that a much older civilization lived on this planet nearly a billion years ago, a civilization so advanced they could make immortal mummies. What do you think about all this? Let me know in the comments below. Were Neanderthals actually geniuses? It's about time we change the way we talk about Neanderthals. A shocking new discovery has proven that Neanderthals were way smarter than people give them credit for. Cavemen and cavewomen weren't grunting dumbly in their caves. They were inventing things and making art. Neanderthals may have single-handedly invented glue. A new study was published in the journal Science Advances. Researchers, including lead author Patrick Schmidt, found evidence of complex adhesives used to build stone tools. Neanderthals figured out how to make glue using a mixture of bitumen and ochre. The Neanderthal glue was bizarrely similar to the first glue invented by Homo sapiens in Africa. I bet this wasn't on your bingo card of things to learn this week, that Neanderthals were the inventors of glue. The glued together stone tools studied by Patrick and his team were discovered in France at Le Moustier site. They date back an astonishing 40,000 years. Here's some more information about the invention and the materials involved. Bitumen is, for all intents and purposes, tar. It's a naturally occurring substance made from decomposing organic matter. It's the black, oily form of petroleum that you find in tar pits. Ochre is a natural pigment found across the world. It's essentially earth, fancy dirt that was used to make cave paintings by our prehistoric ancestors. When you put these two ingredients together, you get an adhesive. Another common ingredient for prehistoric adhesives was birch pitch. 
something also used by Neanderthals. Scientists think glue, as random as that seems, was one of the first expressions of the cognitive process. It was one of the very first things invented by a hominin. But who invented it first? Was it Homo sapiens or Neanderthals? Scientists aren't sure who won at that race only that they both figured it out. Patrick said the study proved that both early human species had the same thought patterns. So evidently Neanderthals were just as smart as us. The Oakville Blobs Something incredible was discovered in 1994 that still has the possibility to change history. Gelatinous blobs fell from the sky like gooey wads of gunk from space, and everybody got sick. It's the craziest story to ever come out of Oakville, Washington. There isn't much to say for context. It was summer, with nothing unusual going on in a small town. Then from the sky came bizarre blobs that looked like sticky chunks of jelly. It was like a jam factory exploded, raining down globs of slime on the town. But it didn't happen all at once. It started with one woman who reported the globs raining down on her property in the middle of the night. The next day, her mother developed symptoms of the flu. It seemed clear the two things were connected. Over the following three weeks, five more reports came in of globs falling randomly throughout town. Almost everyone who came into contact with the blobs got sick. Naturally, scientists came to investigate. This kind of phenomenon can't just happen without people noticing. Jelly blobs don't generally fall out of the sky. Specialists from the Washington State Department of Health collected samples. According to BBC Science Focus, researcher Mike Osweiler identified two species of bacteria within the gelatinous material. However, the bacteria shouldn't have been harmful to people. I'd like to stop here just to mention one really important fact. You hear weird stories like this a lot, especially on social media and YouTube, but not all of the stories are real. The Oakville blobs really did fall from the sky. This is all 100% confirmed. It's considered one of the best recorded incidents of such a phenomenon anywhere in the world. Even the cops bore witness to the shocking event. Officer David Lacey said that on August 1st, 1994, at approximately 3 a.m., the goop hit the windshield of his car while he was on patrol. Officer Lacey said he turned on his windshield wipers and the goop smeared over his windshield like an oil. Another local by the name of Dottie Hearn described the goo as looking like big chunks of hail. Both Lacey and Hearn became ill after witnessing the goop. Lacey said he was violently sick and almost couldn't breathe. Dottie Hearn collapsed and had to be whisked to the hospital, where it was found that she had suddenly come down with an ear infection. It's the reality of the blobs that makes the conclusion of the story so shocking. Nobody has ever been able to figure out what the blobs were. Nobody will ever know what the blobs were because every sample is gone. All the samples at the Washington Department of Health disappeared into thin air. All records of them have vanished. Every trace of the mysterious goo from the sky is gone. I can't give you any straight answers, but I can share with you some theories. A lot of people think they were jellyfish that got sucked into rain clouds during an Air Force bombing test 50 miles away in the Pacific Ocean. There's another popular theory that the goo came from an airplane toilet, but that's as unlikely as it is nasty. The most interesting explanation can be found in legends from the 14th century. People in the Middle Ages told stories of a substance called star jelly or astral jelly, which occasionally fell from the heavens during meteor showers. Still, nobody knows what it is or where it came from. Humans with tails? If you had the option, would you give yourself a tail? A big bushy tail sprouting out from your tailbone like a happy monkey? If your answer is yes, I have some disappointing news for you. 25 million years ago, give or take a few centuries, an evolutionary split occurred. The ancient ancestors of apes, monkeys, and humans broke apart. As our great-great-great-great-great-grand apes changed, they lost their tails. But why? The why of it has always been a big mystery to scientists. What was the point of losing our tails when they could have come in so handy? How cool would it be to walk down the street with a grocery bag in one hand, your cell phone in the other, and a beverage gripped in your tail? 
I think it would be very handy indeed. Now scientists think they have gotten to the bottom of the mystery, and it could change history forever. In fact, your future kids could be born with tails and be the envy of every kid in their class. Scientist Bo Xia at the New York University began his journey toward the discovery after injuring his tailbone. While in recovery, the researcher became obsessed with uncovering the amazing secrets of our evolution. His studies brought him to something called alu elements, which are DNA sequences found only in primates. Bo uncovered a pair of alu elements inside the TBXT gene that are only in great apes, not monkeys. Through gene sequencing, some RNA splicing, and a lot of squinting through a microscope, Bo made a breakthrough. He and his team introduced the alu elements into mice, which resulted in them losing their tails. The experiment copied what happened with the evolutionary transition from ancient creatures with a tail to apes and humans. Scientists mimicked what happened in the genes when we split from our common ancestor, with our relatives losing their tails and monkeys keeping theirs. This study is groundbreaking because it's not just about tails, though tails are what makes it so compelling. The revelation has deepened scientific understanding of evolutionary biology. It's also helped show how human beings steadily came into being over millions of years. Most exciting of all is that Bo's discovery has opened new doors for genomic analysis and splicing mechanisms. Scientists can now manipulate genes of animals to have them born without tails. They can presumably do the opposite to give people tails. If you think body modification is popular now, wait until people can give themselves extra body parts. The Vanishing of Christy Island I'd like to explore an island with you that doesn't exist. I know, it seems impossible, but bear with me. Chrysi Island is one of the greatest mysteries of the ancient Greek sagas from Homer and Sophocles. But scientists can't figure out if Homer made it up or if the island disappeared into thin air. Homer is one of history's greatest ancient authors. He was the genius behind the Odyssey and the Iliad, books that have been immortalized in a way few other works of fiction have. According to the man himself, Chrysi Island was in the Aegean Sea near Lemnos. The island was most famous for its temple to Apollo. Though the island's people worshipped Chrysi as their main deity, Chrysi was a minor goddess of uncertain origin, perhaps a nymph. She wasn't a goddess of any in particular, not that historians know about anyway, she may have been a goddess only worshipped by the curious islanders. By the 2nd century AD, Chrysi Island was gone. Greek historian Pausanias wrote that it sank deep beneath the sea. There had allegedly been a prophecy that the island would sink foretelling of the disaster. For hundreds of years, Greeks wrote of the island as if it were real. Then they told stories of how it sank. This is unique in that the story changed in real time. What I mean is that it's not like the legend of Atlantis where all the stories tell of its sinking after the fact. Pretty much every myth of Atlantis starts with it being destroyed. In the case of Chrysi, the island was a real place that appeared in stories alongside other real places. Then, all of a sudden, ancient historians started talking about how it sank as if they were recording a real event. Modern historians think the island likely did exist until around 73 BC. So where is the island today? There have been investigations to find it. Researchers in the 1960s found a sunken landmass near the island of Lemnos at a depth of 40 feet. It's still there today, a chunk of land about 10 square miles. It's even covered in weird stone blocks that could be the ruins of Apollo's temple. The mysterious island that vanished might be found any day now. And now for number 10, but first, it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Omar Sr. and Lack of RMLVRPL, I hope I got all those letters, for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about discoveries that could change history as we know it. The Rodopi Skull, an alien mystery. The Rodopi Skull is said to be the skull of an alien, the actual head of a creature from another world. Could this creepy thing prove that aliens live among us? The anomalous skull was found in the Rodopi Mountains of Bulgaria many years ago. Exactly when, I do not know. The reports surrounding the skull are unusual, making it tough to gain any real information. There are pictures of it all over the internet, many of them quite old. It seems to be a real artifact. It was also supposedly studied by Katya Malamit and Professor Dmitry Kovachev at the Bulgarian Academy of Science. Both researchers said they had 
had never seen anything like it before. The skull gives you a weird and eerie feeling if you look at it for too long. It's clearly not human, although it's roughly the same size as a human baby skull. It appears to have six hollow cavities within it, which biological experts claim could have been used to hold the alien sensory organs. Human skulls have two cavities for our eyeballs. The alien skull is similar, only with six cavities. Maybe it had six eyeballs or other weird organs. Perhaps its organs allowed it to do things like read minds or see it in infrared. If you had extra organs, what would you want them to do? If the cranium is real, it could be proof of alien life. The glaring issues are that nobody knows how old it is, where it's being held now, and what if it's made of paper mache? It could be an elaborate hoax or a real skull to change human history, or it could be an animal skull. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. The Kashmir Giants Take a look at these two men and tell me they aren't giants. As you can see in the old picture, they are huge, each one over seven feet tall. The brothers, believed to be the last in a line of ancient giants, stand on either side of Professor Rickalton. Rickalton was an average guy but looks very tiny between the giants. Almost nothing is known about the Kashmir Giants other than that they appeared at a party in 1903 and shocked those in attendance. The party was held by Lord George Curzon, who was the Viceroy of India. After Queen Victoria's death in 1901, Edward ascended to the throne. Along with being King of England, Edward also became the Emperor of India. He didn't do much to govern the state, as that was left to the Governor General and the Viceroy. Lord George Curzon wanted to host a party to celebrate Edward's coronation. The party came to be known as the Delhi Durbar of 1903. Edward refused to visit India, so he sent his brother, the Duke, in his place. Even without the king coming, Lord Curzon spared no expense. He invited all the elite families of India and put on an epic display of the country's wealth. There were princes, maharaja, and many important people. Great parties arrived with parades of elephants decorated in elephant-sized gold jewelry. Small personal armies showed up with each prince. With the army of the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir came twin brothers known as the Giants of Kashmir. One of the brothers stood an incredible 7 feet 6 inches, while the other was 7 feet 4 inches. At the time, it's believed they were the tallest people in the world. When American photographer James Recalton saw them, he was obsessed and took half a dozen photos with the giants. Here's another one that he took. It was thanks to these photos that the tale of the giants spread around the world. Unfortunately though, not even their names are known. All James documented was that they came from a region called Balmokand. But here's the unbelievable part. Balmokand is not on any known map. It's a region that supposedly doesn't even exist. There are many who believe the giants of Kashmir hailed from a realm of real giants. Some say they were the last of a mighty race of titans who had been surviving since pre-flood times. Then again, maybe they just happened to be really tall and from a place that no other living person had ever heard of. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Doomed Dinosaurs how different the world would look today if a certain asteroid had missed our planet 66 million years ago. But what if it didn't matter? A new study has shown that even without the asteroid, dinosaurs were doomed. Ancient history has changed yet again. Scientists are now saying dinosaurs were already experiencing a steep decline. For the last 10 million years before the asteroid hit, they had already been going steadily extinct. Scientists figured this out by peering into the past using all the modern tools at their disposal. They found that the planet was experiencing a radical change in climate. It was cooling very quickly. With the previous accumulation of greenhouse gases caused by volcanic activity disappearing, the sudden cooling was hitting the dinosaurs hard. They had been given millions of years to evolve in a very hot climate. Dinosaurs were mesothermal, not quite cold-blooded, but not quite warm-blooded. As temperatures dropped, they found it impossible to regulate their temperature. They were having a difficult time breeding because of this. With a change in climate comes a change in vegetation. The fossil record has shown that just before the extinction event, tropical plants were dying and being replaced by the sort of woodland plants more familiar to those who live in the north. This would have been bad for some and good for others. Dinosaurs like the Hadrosaur would have flourished, 
while dinosaurs like the Triceratops would have been brought to extinction. It's all about the circle of life. As the weather changed, the animals changed too. Although scientists don't know for sure if dinosaurs would have gone extinct, they are becoming more convinced of it. Even without that pesky space rock setting off what was basically a prehistoric nuclear explosion, the dinos were doomed. The Boy from Mars In 2017, a young boy from Russia made a really unusual claim. Lots of kids like to pretend they are superheroes or cowboys or ghosts, I don't know. But Bariska Kiprayanovich claimed that he was from Mars. This wouldn't really be newsworthy, except for the unprecedented astronomical knowledge the child displayed at only 11 years old. For hardly having two numbers in his age, Bariska spun quite a yarn. He claimed that he is in fact a Martian that was turned into a human. He was originally from Mars, but was reborn on Earth as some bizarre form of intergalactic reincarnation. Those are not two words I ever thought I'd put together. Bariska also said his race disappeared from Mars because of a nuclear war that happened thousands of years ago. Bariska claimed the same thing is bound to happen to Earth. But not to worry, Bariska has been sent here to save us from ourselves. The story is surprisingly long. The young boy went on and on about how he remembered his life as a Martian pilot. He remembered the apocalyptic nuclear war that was waged between two factions on Mars. Apparently, there are still members of his species trying to rebuild their civilization, though for whatever reason, you can't see them with a telescope. Now let's take a closer look at this young boy and see why he's become so famous over the last few years. According to his doctor, Bariska started speaking when he was only a few months old. By the time he was a year and a half, he could read, draw, and paint. All his teachers were astounded by his highly advanced writing and language skills. The child has been confirmed as the bona fide super genius. The whole thing is impossible to resolve. Perhaps Martian civilization did exist. Maybe they did bomb themselves back to whatever Mars version of the Stone Age is. Bariska, known also as the Indigo Child, says humanity's fate will change when the Great Sphinx of Egypt is opened. The Dropa Stones it's tough to call the Dropa Stones a discovery because there isn't any official proof they exist. What I do have is a story that could change the history of ancient China. The tale attached to the mythical artifacts begins with a Chinese archaeologist and some mysterious caves. In 1937, Qi Pu Te led an expedition into the Bayan Har Mountains. There, inside a previously unexplored series of caves, were the remains of inhuman creatures. The skeletons belong to beings with large oval heads. To be frank, they look like aliens. Alongside the alien bodies were 716 stone discs. Each disc was engraved with a series of spirals, lines, and grooves. They sort of looked like hieroglyphs. Most of the discs were taken from the caves and brought back to be studied. Chinese professor Tsum Um Nui said the engravings represented written characters. After he was left alone for a long time with the stones, he came up with a translation. The translation is incredible, crazy, and unbelievable, but here it is all the same. I'll let you be the judge. The professor said that written upon the stones was the story of the Dropa aliens, who crashed their spaceship in China 12,000 years ago. They tried to settle on Earth since there was no escape. They were like castaways lost on a desert island, only the island of Earth wasn't quite deserted. They were hunted down by local tribespeople and killed. Extraterrestrials crashed on Earth only to be murdered by Stone Age people with bows and rock axes. I guess they didn't bring their plasma rays with them. Following the publication of the translation, Tsum Um Nui was ridiculed mercilessly. He was so horribly embarrassed that he was kicked out of the academic community and fled the country in exile. There is so much controversy surrounding the stones that I don't know where to start. Most mainstream scientists don't believe any of the story is real. There isn't any proof that any of the people I just told you about ever existed. There is no official record of the stones ever being displayed in a museum. Even French ufologist Jacques Vallée said the tale is a hoax. But there are a lot of people who believe the story. In 1974, Austrian engineer Ernst Wegerer said he visited the Banpo Museum in Xi'an and saw two of the Dropa stones. However, by 1994, the discs were gone. 
What do you think happened to them? And what do you think of the professor's theory of the Dropa aliens? Let me know in the comments. The Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter One of the most contested events in history is the arrival of human beings in North America. Scientists through the ages have never been able to agree on when people first stepped foot on the continent. The answer is always changing. If you were a college student in the 1970s, you'll no doubt remember what archaeology professors taught at the time. They told everybody that people arrived in North America from Asia and Siberia 13,000 years ago. A culture known as the Clovis crossed a land bridge to migrate east to west. Then the land bridge was submerged as the ice from the Ice Age melted and the sea levels rose. This is no longer verified science. New discoveries are coming out all the time confirming that humans were in North America long before 13,000 years ago. Discoveries like the ones at the Rimrock Draw Rock Shelter in Oregon. This could be one of the oldest places in North America that humans occupied. The open air site is easy to miss. It's a small shelter made of rocks in the midst of an otherwise barren scrub brush desert. A stream used to run through the site but is now long gone and dry. Since 2011, archaeologists at the University of Oregon have been hard at work excavating the ancient rock shelter. In 2012, they made their first amazing discovery. They uncovered camel teeth fragments. It's true, Oregon used to be overrun with gigantic camels. The teeth fragments were buried underneath a layer of volcanic ash. That volcanic ash came from none other than Mount St. Helens when it erupted 15,000 years ago. This was only the start of their discoveries. Shortly after, Patrick O'Grady and his colleagues discovered orange agate scrapers stained with bison blood beneath the ash. The scrapers are roughly 15,800 years old. Here's a picture of one of the scrapers, courtesy of the University of Oregon Archaeological Field School. These tools were typically used for scraping the hide from animals. Their presence at the site confirms it was occupied by human beings. What does this mean for human history? It's further proof that humans were in North America a lot earlier than previously thought. Still, human migration into the Americas is a major mystery. Some believe it wasn't even a land bridge that allowed humans to reach this part of the world. Rather, they may have crossed from Asia in seafaring canoes and traveled along the coast. It could explain why people seemingly settled in North and South America around the same time. Not only that, but it could explain why such mighty civilizations started on the West Coast, particularly in Peru. Haven't you ever wondered why Peru hosted such grand empires compared to ancient cultures in North America? The Caralsupe civilization thrived in 3000 BC in Peru, 2,500 years before the Maya of Mexico. Yet at the same time, 5,000 years ago, archaic cultures were still hunting sea mammals in Canada and living as nomads. I get that it's cold in the north and this may have hampered the development of civilization, but even so, something doesn't quite add up with the timeline for people in the Americas. The Amazing Technology of Abu Sir A short 30 minutes from Giza, where the Great Pyramids stand tall and proud, is a site of great mystery. It's at this site where you can find proof of advanced technology used to drill through granite with impeccable precision. Many believe the evidence at Abu Sir confirms that the ancient Egyptians had access to tools beyond their years. There are many pyramids spread across the ancient burial ground. Five of them are accessible to tourists. While I could talk for hours about the intricacies and lost histories of each individual pyramid, let's just focus on one. The Pyramid of Sahure deserves your attention because it's here where you can truly see the proof of Egyptian ingenuity. Sahura's pyramid is still standing, though it is in rough shape. That's not surprising, seeing as the pyramid complex was built near the start of the 25th century BC for Pharaoh Sahure. That was 4,500 years ago. He was one of the first rulers to build a pyramid in Abu Sir, inspiring those who came after him to do the same. Near Sahura's pyramid, the Sun Temple of Userkaf once stood. He was also a pharaoh in the 5th dynasty, ruling a few years prior to Sahure. Sun temples were grand places of worship built in the 5th dynasty by a string of pharaohs. They were dedicated to the sun god Ra, huge towering structures that pierced the clouds. 
only a couple of the legendary sun temples have been found, making them some of the rarest temples in Egypt. When you arrive at the site of Sahura's pyramid, there is one thing you'll notice immediately. The place is crowded by a field of rubble. It's utter chaos, with big chunks of limestone, granite, and alabaster strewn about the pyramid like a bomb went off. It's these littered chunks of granite that give us a glimpse into the building techniques of ancient Egypt. So many of the stones have perfect holes drilled in them from where they were probably going to be put together like Lego blocks. You can see the field of rubble I was talking about, and here are the holes that were carved into the blocks. Notice the smooth sides of the borehole. How did they do it? I can tell you how people do it today, and from that you can decide if the Egyptians had a little extra help when it came to their technology. In order to drill granite, you need a specialized drill head that revolves at about 900 RPM. Even at this incredible rate of speed, a drill will only cut into the granite about an inch every few minutes. It's true that you can drill into granite much slower. Even a constant drip from a leaky faucet will eventually bore a hole through granite. But to get the perfectly smooth holes like you just saw at Abu Sir, it takes modern technology. You need a battery that can get your drill spinning fast enough to make perfectly smooth holes. So what does all of this mean? There are a lot of theories, of course. One of the more popular ones is that the Egyptians were not the first people at Abu Sir. There may have been a pre-flood civilization here first. The technology could have been from them. Perhaps the Egyptian builders used the last few tools the antediluvian people left behind. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up for more videos like these. And stick around for some older content that you might have missed. New Egyptian Mummy The discovery of a new Egyptian mummy could just be rewriting history. In 2019, archaeologists discovered the mummified body of a nobleman from ancient Egypt to be much older than previously thought. The nobleman is called Kui and they have dated his remains back to the days of the Old Kingdom, about 1,000 years earlier than researchers had reported. This makes Kui one of the oldest mummies ever uncovered. It changes history for one primary reason. It shows evidence that the Egyptians were using advanced embalming techniques over 1,000 years before previously assumed. This nobleman was mummified 4,000 years ago, and it was done with shocking sophistication. The process, the materials that were used, the quality of the resin, and the linen dressing, it was all ahead of their time. According to Professor Salima Ikram, the head of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo, historians must revise every single book about mummification and the history of Egypt's Old Kingdom. All the dates need to be changed. Until now, researchers thought mummification during the days of the Old Kingdom was a simple process basic dehydration, and frequently unsuccessful removal of the brain. Not to mention more detail given to the appearance of the mummy than the actual science behind the process. But that's not true. It must have been that poorer people closer to the bottom of the social ladder had bad mummifications, while the richest in society had the knowledge to do things the right way. Vikings in the New World a shocking recent discovery has changed everything we understand about Vikings in the New World. Researchers in Canada have finally found a second Viking settlement in North America. It's close to the first one at Lansau Meadows, just a few miles away at a place called Point Rosé. It's a small peninsula that stretches off the southern tip of Newfoundland and into the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. Researchers here discovered a stone hearth that Vikings had once used for working iron. Those same Vikings built their first settlement on the northern tip of Newfoundland. But just what exactly was happening here 1,000 years ago? It's all become quite confusing with this newest discovery. We know the first settlement at Lansau Meadows was temporary. It was more of a way station that was abandoned by the Vikings after a couple of years. But this newest place at Point Rosé shows evidence of a longer habitation. Plus, it's on the other side of the island. It would have taken a significant amount of time and effort to journey from the first site to the second site. Sadly, there's not much remaining in the way of archaeological evidence. But if they prove the discovery legitimate, and this was another Viking site, there could be even more such sites spread across the North Atlantic.
The Origin of Man The analysis of a fossil belonging to a species of hominin known as El Greco has flipped everything we know about the evolution of mankind on its head. The analysis of the fossils, which belong to a type of early human which arose in the Mediterranean part of Europe, suggests humans didn't emerge in Africa. They may have started in Europe, then moved into Africa. If true, every history book in the world will need to be rewritten. Because until now, just about every scientist and historian in the world has agreed that human life started in Africa. The predominant theory has always been that a small group of hominids evolved in Africa, then dispersed through the rest of the world to become Denisovans and Neanderthals, and eventually humans. But looking at the tooth and lower jawbone of the El Greco fossils, archaeologists have thrown the Africa theory out the window. Archaeologists found these fossils in Bulgaria, and these bones belong to the oldest, pre-human, ape-like creature ever identified. And if it was living in Europe, that means it was there over 4 million years earlier than any similar human-like creature discovered in Africa. Friendship Ornaments Friendship is not a modern invention. 6,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer communities in the northeast of Europe weren't just a bunch of primitive cave people. They were humans with emotions and friends. A recently discovered Stone Age artifact has proven beyond any doubt just how important friendship was to this group of people. Scientists believed for a long time they were nothing but bird brain troglodytes. But throughout Finland and near the Lake Onega region in Russia, archaeologists have been digging up broken pendants. These people made broken pendants or ornaments from slate rings. Researchers simply thought they were lost and buried for thousands of years. But a recent study by scientists at the University of Helsinki has proved something different. People broke these ornaments on purpose and smashed them into fragments to be used as Stone Age friendship necklaces. I'm talking about matching necklaces that, when put together, form a heart-shaped pendant. You know, the BFF style of necklace. Picture this in your head, except 6,000 years ago. These Stone Age people broke the larger ornaments on purpose then fashioned each half into a necklace to be worn by a pair of long-distance friends. Researchers know this because they found two matching fragments at two different locations, meaning a different person wore each piece. They found the same thing multiple times, proving it wasn't a fluke. It seems nomadic ancient people, even though they lived a vagabond nomadic lifestyle, still kept reminders of their friends in faraway places. Did you use a friendship necklace or a bracelet? Let me know in the comments below! The Lost City of Atlantis The confirmed discovery of the lost city of Atlantis would flip the world upside down. People have been searching for Atlantis for so long that finding it today would be like finding Godzilla sleeping in the ocean somewhere. How close is Plato's story to real history? It seems researchers are getting closer to the Atlantis mystery. After years of research, and with the help of satellite technology, researcher Christos A. Jonis has revealed the most likely prehistoric setting for Atlantis, an actual place currently 400 feet underwater. It's called the Cyclades Plateau, and in the year 9600 BC, it was a super island off the coast of mainland Greece. What's fascinating about the plateau is that it corresponds to the time when Plato described Atlantis. To Plato, Atlantis went extinct roughly 11,000 years ago, a very long time ago. That was just around the end of the last ice age. The Greek islands that we know about today, like Mykonos and Santorini, were mountainous parts of the Cyclades Plateau. But after monumental flooding around 8,000 BC, the islands we see now are the only parts of the larger plateau still sticking out of the water. The point of this whole thing is that Atlantis was right there off the coast of Athens. All the small islands of the Aegean Sea were once part of a solid landmass that was likely called Atlantis, and when it flooded, it became broken up into tiny islands. If the water level ever drops 400 feet, the island of Atlantis will once more be visible as a whole. If this theory of Atlantis is true, how do you think Plato could have known about a flood that happened 8,000 years before he lived? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already! Romans in Canada A shipwreck in Nova Scotia, Canada has revealed some unique evidence that suggests the Romans were the first people to discover North America. 
this would rewrite history in a lot of ways. Not only would it rewrite the original rewrite of the Vikings discovering North America, but it would show the Romans were more sea-savvy than anyone had realized. The biggest piece of evidence for this comes from a Roman sword, a piece of ancient treasure fished out of the ocean while a man and his son were hunting scallops off the coast. But they never told anyone about the discovery, because in Nova Scotia, the government owns all the shipwrecks and any treasure discovered belonging to one. So they kept this sword a secret for decades. It wasn't until after the man died that he passed the sword down to his daughter, and then it was her husband who finally alerted some archaeological authorities. According to researcher J. Hutton Pulitzer, the Roman sword is authentic. A test showed it is made of the same ore as Roman swords. But no one has ever found the shipwreck it came out of. There are a lot of shipwrecks scattered around the coast here, and almost nobody is investigating them. But that doesn't change the fact that a man and his son found a sword from ancient Rome in the waters of Canada. Maybe a Roman brought it to Canadian shores, or someone took the sword from a Roman. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Mungo Man the Mungo Man was discovered by geologist Jim Bowler in New South Wales in 1974. The Mungo Man's bones proved to be the oldest remains of any indigenous Australian in the country. Archaeologists dated them at 40,000 years old, and they immediately changed the history of Australia. These bones are still the oldest Homo sapiens remains ever found on the continent of Australia. This was a shocking revelation in the 1970s because it proved definitively that the indigenous peoples, the native Australian groups, were the first to live on the land. To give you an idea of how important this timescale is, the indigenous people of Australia were present on the island for about four times longer than Native Americans in North America. The dating of the Mungo Man skeleton proved that when Native Americans were first migrating to North America, people had already been living in Australia for 30,000 years. This discovery changed the modern European ideas of what Australia is, reforming the nation's known history. Very short farmers. A shocking new discovery says that when human beings stopped hunting and gathering and started farming, it had extremely negative health side effects. A recent study combined genetics and skeletal remains to prove that 12,000 years ago in Europe, the earliest farmers were extremely short. Researchers from Penn State wanted to see what happened when humans stopped moving around, gave up hunting, and became sedentary farmers. They thought a good way to do this was to look at the height of ancient people around the same time period. So, about 40 international researchers got together and looked at the heights of people who lived before and after the Neolithic era, until the Iron Ages. The result of this in-depth study was a graph of heights from 38,000 to 2,400 years ago. We can now see the height of Europeans from the days of mammoth hunters to the time of farmers. And what we see is that the first farmers were approximately 1.5 inches shorter on average than previous humans. But as time continued, people once more got taller. They got taller in the Copper Age, a little more in the Bronze Age, and back up to pre-agricultural human height after the Iron Age. Something happened when we started farming that made us short. The issue right now is that scientists don't know what that was. The Oldest Fossil Scientists have discovered what they say could be the oldest fossil on the planet. This ancient fossil is 3.75 billion years old, and it could rewrite everything we know about life on this planet. They made the discovery in Quebec, Canada. Associate Professor in Astrobiology at the University College London, Dominic Papineau, found the fossil while on an expedition in 2008. But it wasn't until 2017 that he published his findings. He discovered tiny fibers of bacteria left behind in ordinary rocks. That means the bacteria were alive and thriving at the time the fossil was made. This means they existed much earlier. The study says the bacteria could have been around 4.2 billion years ago, even though scientists agree that that would be impossible. Nobody believed life could have existed on the primordial Earth, not at the very beginning of our planet's formation. Scientists thought it took around a billion years for life to finally kick off in any meaningful way. But this bacteria proves otherwise. 
Now it looks like there were diverse microbial ecosystems at the very beginning of the planet's formation, or at least soon after. What this means for the rest of the universe is shocking. If there was life on primordial Earth, a place as inhospitable as Mars, there could be microbial life on every other planet in the solar system. Or at least there could have been, billions of years ago, the roundels. Archaeologists recently discovered structures even older than the Egyptian pyramids in Central Europe, and nobody is sure who put them there. These structures are called roundels, and they are found in Czech. The structures are circular ditches, primitive Neolithic fortifications around what was probably once a modest settlement. They were built around 4800 BC. But then they were abandoned about 200 years later in 4600 BC. The huge mystery is that scientists can't exactly figure out why. What they know is that researchers have found other similar fortifications across Europe. This exact style, the central settlement surrounded by ditches and fortified walls, was used for about 300 years before completely vanishing. Experts believe roundels were a kind of blip in history, an idea that worked well for a while but then was abandoned because society changed. We don't know what that change was, but it was big enough that it changed history. Newer, more complex settlements were made, and human beings started advancing. What's weird is that it happened so quickly. It almost seems like some unknown event caused this dramatic switch from primitive living to megalithic city building. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon for another video on ancient history. Bye!